Uh, so the steps for executing the reunified variable are pretty much similar. You still need that token. And the first thing I did in C Sharp was I did p invoke with virtual alloc to obtain an RWX memory pointer that I can execute. And then I was just obtaining that UEFI variable back into that buffer so I could execute it. Uh, so the first step, same idea, you need that privilege. The second step is I start p invoking some memory so I have RWX. Uh, but you can't actually really do that in C Sharp because it's abnormal to bring things into your import address table that aren't actually C Sharp specific. Um, so like all of the virtual calls are more suspicious than getting a new process token because uh, within like C Sharp there's no real way to do like process token stuff. You have to pretty much pee invoke, so it's not it's suspicious. It is suspicious for EDR products that you're doing virtual outlet, virtual free, and virtual protect within C Sharp. It's like, whoa, stop right there. We're going to tell the blue team about this and they're going to hunt you down. So we can't do that. Hilariously enough, as we were going through this research, um, OJ is working on like a, a C sharp C alarm interpreter, and he was dealing with some stuff, and he also says the same thing, like don't pee invoke your .NET apps. Like EDR is gonna find you. Like as he says, it's the proverbial solution for them hunting you down. Uh, so we're, we're not gonna have, we, we're gonna lose the ability to pee invoke to get RWX memory, uh, which is kind of a problem. So we can't do step two anymore. But fear not, uh, the CLR and C-sharp is fantastic for malware, so we're going to actually just now, instead of doing any virtual calls, we're going to use reflection within C-sharp to obtain RWX JIT memory, which just-in-time compilation leads RWX memory pages, if you're not familiar with it, to read the UEFI variable into that. Then we're going to write the UEFI variable into a method table pointer, and then we're going to execute the method as if nothing actually ever happened. Uh, so those are the steps. I'm going to actually go through that in detail because that was probably a little bit jarring. Basically, in C Sharp, if you're not familiar with it, because it's an intermediate level uh, language representation of code, it has to get just in time compiled to assembly code before it gets executed by the processor. So within C Sharp, there's this huge method table that contains all of the methods that the C Sharp application knows about, and all of those contain a JIT stub for those classes methods. So essentially what that means is at the time of just-in-time compilation, the method table gets referenced. You then get a function pointer to the executable assembly code that the processor will run, which is RWX due to the notion of JIT. You can grab that method pointer, dereference the function pointer that the assembly code lives to, which is uh, just the location of the method that you're clobbering, and overwrite it. So this essentially means we can declare a method that we don't care about, force it to just-in-time compile, get the pointer to it, and then overwrite it. Uh, so it's basically like read to live C, but in C sharp, and it's like more fucky. <laughs> so the steps for that look like this. We're essentially going to now obtain an RWX chip memory page to read the variable into. That's gonna consist of defining a method uh, to overwrite, jitting the method, obtaining the pointer to the method, and then overwriting it and calling it. So we'll define a method to overwrite. This is in the code that I'm going to be releasing. It's just called overwrite me. It does nothing. We'll jit the method. So here you can see in reflection, I'm doing a type of the program I'm in, get method overwrite me. I call compile service runtime helpers prepare method, which is essentially just gonna jit that with the method handle. So I have my method dot method handle that's dereferencing one of the pointers. And then I obtain the pointer to the method, which is just get function pointer once I've jitted it. So now I have the location of the raw assembly code after JIT in that RWX memory location. And so now I write the UEFI variable payload that's stored in MVRAM into the pointer to method. So I just call get firmware variable EX. Uh, you can see the third argument there after the tuple is pointer to method, with then the fourth argument being buffer length. That's going to take the MVRAM out, plop it in, and then I can just execute the method called overwrite me as if it was actual C sharp code and I haven't done anything else. So we're gonna just do a quick demo of what that looks like uh, to kind of tie it all together in Windows. Um, step one, you obtain your, you obtain your shell on target. Uh, we've already done that, so step one's kind of skipped. We're then gonna run write UEFI C sharp. You'll see this with a, with a writer binary that I've written. Uh, in an actual like, red team engagement or in a campaign, you'd probably do this with like whatever C2 framework you were using. So you can use the C sharp code, say like a cobalt strike with some of the functionality there and do it on Windows boxes. Um, you'll then do some sort of persistence mechanism for the reader binary, which is going to go through 
and do the steps I just demonstrated with reflection. Um, it's like a four kilobyte binary you'll use for persistence. You can, you know, we're not giving you a persistence mechanism. I'm sure all of you have lots in your bag. Uh, you just need to throw this binary somewhere and, and run it. And then we'll, uh, we'll run it to showcase what it looks like. So, Windows demo. This one? Computer or hard? So here I am on Windows. Um, I'm gonna first go through and run a really quick chipsec module. Uh, if you're not familiar with chipsec, it's a UEFI platform security tool that helps security researchers analyze platform firmware. Uh, it does a lot of cool things for UEFI, particularly variables. So what I did here is I just ran a module to dump and list what all the UEFI variables currently on my system are. You can see that there's a lot of them. Do note that most of these are NVBS plus RT. Uh, so most of them are accessible uh, at runtime services to the operating system and they're, of course, because they're persistent, they're persistent and NVRAM. So there they are, you didn't see mine. Here I'm going to dump really quickly the variable list to show you that there's contents of all of these variables. Like this one is kind of funny, like test zero, this is a test. Um, so there's lots of variables here. Nobody really ever audits them. Like I said, AB and EDR doesn't look here. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run write UEFI or UEFI write C sharp. That's gonna write a UEFI variable to NVRAM. I ran chipsec again to show you that it's now there. There it is, uh, C sharp dash UEFI. So now that that's there on box, I can execute what the payload is. Um, but first I'm gonna show you what that, uh, there's actual like uh, shell code there. So I'll go into the UEFI variables directory with chipsec, I'll dump it out, and there you can see that I have some shell code there that I'm gonna execute out of NVRAM with the, with the, the, the reader binary. Uh, that payload for demo purposes is gonna be our, our favorite demo, uh, Metasploit. So it's just a Meterpreter shell that I'm gonna spin up. I'm gonna go through, run UEFI read seed sharp, and then as you can see from that, uh, I successfully just executed a payload out of NVRAM with like a four kilobyte binary using reflection. So the fun doesn't actually end there. So because this is a persistence mechanism and it's persistent uh, in NVRAM, this means it's gonna survive reboots, it's gonna survive reinstalling your operating system. The only way to clear this out is to like clobber over that variable or uh, pull NVRAM with like an eddy prog and re, uh, like rewrite your UEFI um, variable space. So I'm gonna shut down the box, reboot it, go back to my Metasploit shell, uh, rerun the console, and then it's a cooking show, it takes a long time for Windows to boot, so speed it up. Uh, you know, I just put the payload in the oven. It's gonna be done pretty quickly. The machine's booting. Still booting. It's a cooking show, wait a minute. There it is, let's see. And there we go, I just executed my payload out of NVRAM again uh, with a persistence mechanism out of a UEFI variable. Um, so we kind of like have hand waved the persistence thing. We're gonna leave that as an exercise up to the reader. Like I said, WDAC bypasses are a great way to do this. Uh, in actuality, uh, your payload's a UEFI variable. Like, good luck, have fun, analysts. Uh, we love you still though. Like, we're gonna help you, but this is fun. Um, so like, what about Windows EDR products? We haven't necessarily touched on that. Like, obviously, this is a way to, to mitigate detection. Um, so we looked at a couple of uh, EDR vendors and we found no relevant information pertaining to the usage of either of these API calls, executing out a UEFI variable or anything of that nature. The only thing they're really going to see is that you're executing this binary, uh, but like there's binaries executed on systems all the time. That's not really something too, rele too relevant that's gonna trigger hunt. Um, furthermore, uh, there's a lot of ways currently to sinkhole or to tamper with EDR products. So here's like a five line PowerShell script that you can use to like sinkhole EDR products. This works on a lot of them. Uh, like EDR products are things of software running on a box. Software has configs. Configs can be tampered with. So just tamper with configs a lot of the time and you can get away with anything on a box on Windows. Um, there's a lot of other ways to go about it. We can chat like after the talk about it. Uh, this isn't really a talk about this. So it's a talk about how to do a shit and that's how you hide your shit in Windows. Um, some WDAC bypass are just for references. Uh, now that I've talked about how to do shit in, win in Windows, uh, Mike's going to talk about some Linux stuff. Boy, Windows is silly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
let's, let's, let's talk about Linux. Linux is, you know, what everyone knows that's what the real is. So let's talk about the problem space. Uh, basically, let's introduce our players here. We have, you know, the kernel, we have the EDR, and we have, on the right, we have your sample. And, you know, EDR is looking at your sample, and that's, that's bad. That's what makes it your sample and not your payload. Um, and, you know, the EDR and your sample are actually kind of peers, right? We're both running as privileged processes, and the EDR has some hooks into kernel space to help it do help it do its job. And so that's what that sort of rectangle just above the eyeballs is. Eyeballs are obviously EDR. <laughs> and so like, what does our solution space look like? Well, you know, what we really want is just to make, you know, just to sucker punch the EDR a little bit, you know, while it's not looking, and make sure that it just doesn't look at us at all, and then, then it's back to being our payload. So, you know, how are we gonna do that? We, we need to like, we need to show up early to the fight, right? So that it never sees us coming. So we need to infect something. So, you know, how does your computer, how does your computer boot? And what can we infect? Well, the first thing that boots is the platform firmware, and that's signed by the OEM. You can't really infect that easily. So the next thing, that's signed by Microsoft. The shim, that's signed by Microsoft, and it pivots the key over to the distro. That's a little bit harder to infect. Uh, Grub, you know, signed by the distro, no good. Kernel, signed by the distro, no good. But the RAM disk is generated on system and not signed. This sounds like a good time. And then sometime later, some shit happens and the EDR is just stuck. So obviously what we need to infect is the RAM disk. So how are we gonna, what capabilities do we have? What, 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 what tools do we have at our disposal in the Linux environment to, to make things happen and, and, and make the EDR not look at? So uh, the first sort of uh, wonderful syscall to uh, introduce is ptrace, right? And this is, you know, what we say in the 90s are back again, like ptrace uh, exploitation of processes has been like uh, as, as old as time itself, but, you know, and, and it's, it's tapered off in the, in the modern era because we have policies that prevent you from doing it. You know, like, Yama and SE Linux and App Armor and Silly Sunset Smack and Smoke and whatever. The best part about all this stuff is the policy is implied in, is applied in the user space. All right. So let's 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 go through this. Um, let's go through this in flowchart sort of way. So we have um, the red disk is actually the original PID one. That's actually where. Uh, and it starts from. And then it finds your file system, you know, draws some pretty stuff on screen, like make sure you have the right fonts, whatever. And then it does, it actually deletes everything out of, the, out of the root file system except for the target directory, and then it moves the mount from the target to root, and then it execs system name. And that will come up again, this sort of deleting everything. And then like system D starts and like, you know, the thumbs down with the policy being loaded that prevents you from attacking the EDR. And then of course our eyeballs here on the EDR. So let's let's talk about some other things. We have FA notify. FA notify is kind of a obscure API, but like it's designed for AV. I don't think any of you actually use it, but you know, who cares? It, it, exploiting or using security APIs for unintended things is like one of my favorite things. <laughs> So basically what this lets you do is this lets you, um, you know, do the AV thing, right? Like a, a file is accessed and you have to stop that process from accessing that file, decide whether it's okay, and then you can say if it is to go ahead, which is effectively allows us to inhibit startup of other processes. Uh, another fantastic utility is uh, memfp create. Um, this has been talked about a lot in, 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 the, in the hacker scene, but essentially like you can create a, an anonymous file. And uh, this works like a file, get a file descriptor, uh, and then you can actually access it through, you know, proc pid, fd, uh, even from other processes. This is fantastic. Uh, and you know, the best part is, like everyone says, never touch disk, it's, 
Uh, and then another API that we can use is, and this is also somewhat obscure and not really security relevant, is um, a PRCTL PR set timer select. So we need some marker for our process uh, to say to the EDR, don't look at this. And so we need something that's inheritable, right? So you know you can you can have your village or shell, you can catch out of and, and cast it. Cat also inherits the marker. So um, we do the set timer slack, which basically uh, controls how often you wake up the CPU. It's designed to save power, but I don't care about that. And then lastly, like config EFI bars. This is the kernel config to make the EFI bars file system. You saw what a pain in the ass was to do stuff with EFI and Windows. Windows is dumb, it's just a file system. You just read my files, it's super easy to do some jump scripts. <laughs> And then I talked previously about MS Move. Like basically, um, this, if you look at my code, this is labeled as black magic fuckery. Um, I can go through these steps, but it's really convoluted. But essentially, um, if you want to have a malicious process that survives pivoting the root file system out from under you, there's a whole lot of really weird stuff involving containers and truth and namespaces and weird stuff to do to so they your malicious process sees the real root file system as opposed to seeing the init root file system which is nothing in it. Um, funny story, like even though you can never have two root file systems in Linux, if you don't do this, you have two root file systems in that process, and uh, the, the real one and the init one, and, you, and nothing is there, it's like really messed up. So anyway, let's go through how this, is, how, how this works in practice. So, our little, uh, our little devil emoji here, I like emojis, uh, is our malicious daemon. This is, this is effectively stage one. Um, we, in the, the init script in the RamFS, forks and execs that. We open the uh, EFI bars, we actually mount the EFI bar file system uh, and mount proc and all that. And then we fetch it out of the, uh, we fetch stage two and three out of the EFI, out of the UEFI lab. And then we just kind of stay there and we cross that boundary between an ramfs land and you know the real system land. And that exacts you know our friend system D, which then spawns all kinds of other garbage. And when it spawns the policy load, which we detect through FA notify, we give a stop signal to sysctl, right? Sysctl is gonna apply the policy that says you cannot be traced. And there's our EDR over there. I think you can figure out the next step. Uh, we're going to p trace the uh, the EDR and then like have our way with it. So uh, what p trace allows us to do is basically we stop the process. You can see uh, we probably end up stopping it right after or before or a syscall, and we can just back up. Uh, we can just back up to the syscall. We can control the IP and back to the syscall, and then we can just set EAX and set what syscalls we'd like to make. So we're effectively coercing syscalls into the process. So we can call memfd create. Then in our other process, because we can access proc fd, proc fed fd, we can shove stage stage three in there, which is embedded in stage two, which, by the way, I've never touched this, and. <laughs> Then we can do an mmap. Uh, fortunately, unlike in, in Windows, uh, mmapping rewrite XP pages is like totally normal. Lucy does it all the time. Um, and then we can just put our shellcode in there. And then we set, oops, I went too fast. Then we set our EIP to the sled there. And we actually just jump over. And then we effectively return to, we return to DL open as, um, as was, as we learned yesterday, and as I kind of already knew, like, <laughs> uh, sorry, I forgot the speaker's name. <laughs> we talked about it yesterday. It's only no time. Oh, no, no. Oh, no. I'm out of sync. Anyway, <laughs> so uh, libc has an internal DL open. We can do uh, the old school uh, LD preload trick, except for without LD preloading, we can call the internal DL open and, and half our malicious SO. And that malicious SO can clobber whatever we need to clobber. 
and then we return. All right. So now we can send the continue to our uh, policy load and load the actual policy that prevents us from doing this. And our EDR is actually now looking the other way. So basically, um, if you look at the code and you see our payload, um, and this is sort of a, a point that also Pepper touched on, that uh, you don't want to, there's two options here about clobbering the EDR in the input stage and the output stage. And the input stage is complicated, you have to understand how it processes information from the kernel. The output stage is super simple, you, you've already looked at the logs, you know what they say. You just want to you know, compromise its ability to write things to the output log, or things you don't want to the output log. And then let's our malicious process, and everybody's happy, the EDR's looking away, and then you can blunder away. So uh, let's do a little demo. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, we're going to uh, tune up Audity. Audity is our example EDR. Uh, you know, I know that like Audity is not a commercial EDR vendor, and you're wondering, does it work on commercial EDR vendor? Yeah, probably. Uh, and uh, we'll install our implant, we'll reboot, we'll set the marker, we'll done, do the exploit again, and we'll show that it runs Audible. All right, let's do the demo. Okay, uh, oh gosh, how do you do this? Windows is hard. What's up? Do it, okay. Oh God, what do I do? Oh gosh! <laughs> I, I know how you live. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. We got the analyst on the, on the right, we got the hacker on the left, and um, what we're going to do is the analyst is going to turn on the auto rules, he's going to tune up on it so that it just uh, has every exec. Then we're going to tear the audit log, we're going to exploit the enterprise tool, you can see we're root, we're making all this noise, it's terrible. You know, they're going to roll this up. You can see it on the right, all that noise. Then we're going to run our infector binary. Our infector binary is going to make a whole lot of noise, but um, this noise is actually really normal because uh, systems generate uh, init ram FSs all the time, so it's fine. So it's going to make basically all the noise that it makes on a uh, on a UEFI or on a init ram FS update. Uh, this is kind of a lot of reused harness from my horse bill talk from a few years ago, but you know. It's as true today as it was there. And like, you know, everything's affected. Have a nice day. And then we're going to reboot. Do, 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 do. Let's do some cooking show time. Let's see. Let's see if I edit this video well enough. I don't think we are. Okay. I'll, I'll edit this time next time. Okay. And again, we've tuned up audit. And you can see we, we're um, displaying the audit uh, log there. Let's see, make a little space there. Okay. And then we're going to do the same thing. We're going to, or actually, we're going to set our marker first, and that's going to make a little bit of noise. But once you set the timer slack, that's what that PRCTL call is, you can see uh, the marker is set, and you can also see that there's no noise in the audit log. Where, and then I, I can root again, and you can see again, no noise. We're invisible. We can we can do all those nasty things we did before. Invisible. It's awesome. Ta-da! And then uh, we, can show the, we can show the policy is applied. You can see like YAML mode three means ptrace is, is completely disabled in the system, and that is true. Like ptrace is now completely disabled in the system, but we inhibited the policy load that prevented us from doing that. And then, uh, like I said, everything's a file system, or everything's a file in Linux, like there's the file system. If you look, like, uh, somewhere in there, there should be a law key. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, right around there. Because hacking is funny. And then, ta-da, we did it. How do we get back to the slides? Okay. <laughs> You know, <laughs> I just want to make 
everyone's going to sleep well tonight, it's, the net happiness increase, you're happy, the analyst is happy, that, that payload that you spend months working on is still your payload and not their sample, everything is good. That's what we're all about, bringing happiness to the world. <laughs> all right, I don't really care about the magician, so yeah, Jeffrey talked about that. Yeah, I mean, I don't really care either, but we felt it necessary. Um, there's a couple of things that you can do to mitigate this. Like, the one biggest thing is, because we're utilizing UEFI variables, is to actually monitor and audit those against your organization's fleet. That would, uh, that would be like the first step to sort of mitigating these risks that we presented. Um, furthermore, EER vendors, if any of you are out there, you should be detecting UEFI APIs and this functionality in Windows and in Linux spaces if you happen to be doing like Linux EDR. Um, it's not really common for applications to set and get firmware variables. Um, and furthermore, like after the installation of a platform, uh, NV, BS, and RT variables being set is pretty weird. Uh, I've never actually seen that in practice. If you have seen that in practice, come talk to me about it, because I'd like to know where, because I want to abuse it. <laughs> um, furthermore, as we kind of showcase, EDR tamper resistance is not at all effective. Uh, it's very easy to like sinkhole uh, the sensor, fill the sensor. As Mike showed, it's very easy to p-trace the sensor. Um, so vendors really just need to work on securing their uh, agents and their processes a little bit better. Um, furthermore, uh, Mike kind of said this in a source called Talk of Black a few years ago, but assembling RAM disks on systems is just silly. Stop doing that if you're a Linux distro. Um, so like, as far as closing the rest goes, uh, we have some future work. So, you know, the system firmware is a, a, great, a great place to, to hide and there's all kinds of goodies in there and we were just touching the surface of it. And it's interesting, like, as we were doing this research, a lot of companies started announcing that they're going to start looking at the firmware space as a place to hunt. But, you know, this is a cat and mouse game, and uh, as far as I can tell, the, uh, are we about the BD cat? Anyway, one of us is already ahead. <laughs> And I think it's us. I'm not sure if we're the cat or the mouse. <laughs> All right. So like in closing, we're bringing that happiness to everybody. We're going to have ourselves a UEFI.party. We're plundering away our loot. We're sucker punching that pesky EDR. Um, and all of our code is located on this GitHub link, uh, Perturb Platypus, or, you know, as we like to call ourselves, APTPP. <laughs> Uh, we, we just pushed the code, we just confirmed it. We had a, we had a, a timer on, on a box that pushed at exactly 10.45. Uh, it's live, so go go have at it, plunder away. Uh, here's some references that you can look at. Uh, that, that's all we got for you.